I um, still don't know quite what to say bringing into show from the intro because we're very professional around here like that. So today's episode, we are joined by a uh, excellent gentleman by the name of Tyler Hoover. He is... Somebody has ever called me that. Uh, a gentleman or excellent or both? Uh, uh, both. <laughs> um, he writes for Auto Traders Oversteer column. Uh, Doug recently went over there and started up that whole thing. And he does his own video production work, which I guess kind of ties into the way... Doug DeMiro does it where it's kind of like your channel, but like the stuff pops up on Oversteer. Kind of ties into some wonderful articles. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, fantastic work. I, I've, you know, I've been reading the stuff, been going through everything, trying to find some of your older work, and I really enjoy reading. I think you've got a very distinctive voice to your writing. Thank you. And I, I it's, it's a pleasure because I listen to your show. I enjoy it. I do. You know, probably fifty thousand miles a year in the car, so it's nice to, you know, get these longer podcasts where you know you bring in a lot of very interesting people and have great conversations, and you're also kind of the Volvo whisperer, you know. So it's kind of fun to see that, you know. I'm I'm definitely a Mercedes nut. That's sort of what I was born and raised on, but uh, we have the same sort of uh, automotive masochism a little bit, where we still love these brands even though they just constantly shit on us, just nonstop. But we just we just don't give up on them. So, so I kind of feel I, you know, I can really connect with you with with your stuff. I really like what you do. Well, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's um on the masochistic side of things. I think it's like uh, ingrained in the personality that like uh, anything that's worth having isn't easy, and these cars sure don't make it easy on you, do they? No, well, man, have you had a lot lately, and I don't know. I anyway, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> eh, well, it, it's as, as someone who writes, I'm sure you could understand this. There's a part of you, because uh, I was writing today about the day two adventure I was having, and uh, like the moment of like all is lost. And I'm sure you can appreciate this as a writer of like tragedy is a lot more interesting to write than you know everything going well. Like sure. the. The Mercedes uh, S600 you have, or it's not the S600. What's the um, the big V12 Mercedes you have? I have it. That's somewhere. the 600, yeah, the bi turbo. I mean, that's I mean, that's sort of where I found my shtick was was you know buying the cheapest car of whatever it is available, buying it totally sight unseen, and then having it show up and and dealing with it. And uh, you know, it's it's definitely very interesting from uh, you know for the for the readers to go through that, and of course to to, of course, they read it and then they love to tell me how stupid I am, and then I do my best to try and prove them wrong. Um, so that's <laughs> it's been a, been a good stick for me, that's for sure. So, well, let, let's kind of go back and start at the beginning then, and we'll kind of work our way towards to the S600. So, you little man uh, started driving thereabouts around the age of four, from what I understand. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I my first car. I it's been in the family since new, and it was a yeah, it's a gray market 1985 500 SL. And my dad was the one. You know, he's I'm just a twinkle in his eye at the time. He's in his early 20s, and and my grandmother wanted a convertible. It was her first new car ever, uh, ever in her whole life, and she wanted a convertible. She's an empty nester, and she wanted a Chrysler LeBaron, which oh god, I mean. No, I mean, I guess it's, it's one of the better convertibles at the time, and there really weren't a lot of convertibles back then because of the, all the insurance things. You know, they kind of did away with them in the 70s and, and uh, you know, started to make a comeback, I guess, then. But, uh, you know, my dad, thank goodness, just went hell no and, and ordered this thing. And she didn't know that it was the all aluminum Rally V8 and the fastest production Mercedes of the day with ABS and the limited slip diff and the spoiler and all that jazz and yeah, you know, she had no idea that she was getting such a you know freaking hot rod, and my dad was just wanting to joyride it when they were out of town, which is something that I did to him. He definitely <laughs> got it later with me, um, uh, but he wanted it black on black, and then she saw the colors, and that's the only thing she really noticed or cared about, and changed it to white on navy blue, and and uh, I guess my dad never drove it because he thought the colors were too <laughs> unpopular. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, she left me in the car when I was four. I decided to go play with it, and uh, the steering wheel locked. You know, where you know with the keys not in it, you have the steering wheel locked. So I decided, well, instead, if that's not working, I'll go for the shifter, and put that in neutral, and rolled it down the hill into the back of a rider truck. And it's really, other than like shitting my pants in the sandbox at two and having my mom yell at me. It's like my oldest memory is wrecking that car. Um, so do you, do you think that's the moment where you started uh, falling in love with automobiles or do you think it's been ingrained since birth? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, it's always been that car. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that is definitely what started it. I, you know, I just obsessed over that thing and, and all the, car movies and you know going to the grocery store and if you behave yourself you get to pick out one hot wheel i'm sure a lot of kids were brought up on that and you know because they were only you know 70 cents or something like that back then and so it just kind of snowballed from there uh, it was always a big car obsession and that happened to be my first car is that 500 sl which is just totally nuts i'm so lucky you know so many people have their their first car stories and it's a total Junker, which is what a kid probably deserves, and and I'm a spoiled little brat and get this incredible car. So I'm very lucky, but uh, I got it, and it was it hadn't been driven in years, and and I had no idea that you're not supposed to drive it with the uh, you know the the <laughs> the temp gauge all the way in the red, you know, for extended periods, and warp the heads and blew the head gaskets and so I get this car for free and then promptly wipe out my savings account spending $5,000 having the heads rebuilt and that sort of started the whole well maybe I should you know know what's going on with the cars and started to learn working on things a little bit so um, well, yeah who, who's who taught you because back we're roughly the same age you're late 20s early 30s right 30 yeah yeah, so we're exactly the same age then. So I'm still two years older than Doug, but they like to call me Doug Junior, which I really like that. <laughs> it, it's weird because Doug just looks so much older than he is. It, I think it's all the wear and tear on his emotions, and I'm not quite sure what happened there. Uh, I think it's because I look like I'm 12. I'm 30, and I still can't grow sideburns, but and still get pimples, and still going through puberty. And boys may crack a few times. So, but yeah, Doug, I mean. Doug's distinguished. He's he's like the Dusecki's man, I guess. I'm so he's very interesting. He's he's a character, but like when we were so around fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, there wasn't a lot of good resources. The internet was around, but it, it was just beginning to be a thing. Um, I had dial up. I, I'm sorry, what? Oh, dial up. Yes, yeah. you know you're discovering all kinds of things on the internet, but not car related. Yes, definitely. Exactly. So how did you learn to work on the cars? Um, well, it was really nice to have a mechanic that did that work for me, kind of kind of pointed me in the direction. And also, there's a forum that still exists called MercedesShop.com. So it, it started in 2000, and I think I officially joined as a member there in 2007 and when I bought my first Mercedes diesel. And, and really, that's when I got into wrenching because those, those old Mercedes diesels are, I mean, really – Legos for grown-ups because it's you know they're so simple you know basically a step away from from farm machinery and uh, uh, that I mean I think that's really where I got my start it's called peach parts now um, but they they still exist I was a moderator had over 5,000 posts there um, so I guess I guess it, it was the internet but it started out with with just that mechanic you know I think feeling sorry for me and and showing me a few things so well, it, it, learning on a Mercedes, so you, the first car was a Mercedes, blue head gasket, mechanic helps teach you. Uh, yeah. So then the second car, was that the diesel Mercedes you had? I had a, you know, another spoiled little brat thing. And so I had, a, I had a Dodge pickup, so I'm a, I'm a 16-year-old kid with two cars, which is idiotic. My dad wanted a truck just to haul around stuff. So it was a really neat Dodge Dakota. Um, but, you know, he needed to haul truck stuff, so when the weather wasn't nice, I got to drive that truck. And then I got a uh, BMW X5 4.4i, which I thought, I mean, that was my dream car and what I wanted at the time at 17, 18 years old, but it turned out to be the worst car in the world. I mean, just horrible. It, it hit 50,001 miles right out of warranty, and I mean, the thing just started blowing up. I mean, you name it. it gosh, I mean, it, it took me a while to come back to BMWs after that because it was, it was so bad. But 
the, really the first car that I bought with my own money was a 1985 300D turbo diesel, and I bought it sight unseen on eBay. I mean, this is a theme. We're going back 10 years. <laughs> and I, I fly out, and the air doesn't work. The motor mounts are pancaked. And, and so if the motor mounts get low enough, then the belt starts cutting on the oil cooler lines. And so rather than replace the motor mounts, this guy decided just to uh, rig his own oil cooler lines around using whatever hose he had available and then, you know, just just clamped it. And so, and thought that was okay. Also, the car that's controlled by vacuum, and it includes turning the car off. It's a vacuum system that, that you know, that shuts the car off. And that wasn't working either. So either I had to get out of the car and push a button under the hood to shut it off, or I found that if I massaged the power door locks and just cycled them up and down with my finger, because it's vacuum system as well, that would shut the car down. And so that, that's, that was my first, that was my first, purchase and then bringing that car back which was documented on the forum and and you know then finding another one and another one and you know that was through college and working through car dealers working for car dealerships and and yeah just kind of it was it was a big mercedes diesel phase for for three or four years i would say before i really started branching out to pretty much anything that could give me brain damage so so you're going through college you're getting these cars you're fixing them up and then you're turning them for a profit while you're working at the dealership or is this a like get a car work on it for a bit and then just kind of keep hanging on to it and move on to another project yeah i mean it's a little bit of both oh sorry i need to turn off my aol but uh i there's a little bit of both i there was some where I made money on a lot of them that I, I didn't. Uh, I like to say that it was a hobby that paid for itself back then, but really I'm sure it was costing me tons of money. But that was a way for me to justify it. So, so but you were working at dealerships while you're going through college? Yeah, I, I was at CarMax for the opening day in Wichita, which was interesting because that was a no-haggle pricing deal, and people didn't understand at CarMax you don't haggle on the price. And so, it, you know... I'm selling a Toyota Camry, and they're like, I'll, I'll give you this. And I'm like, I can't go off a penny, and they think I'm being an asshole. But really, that's just how CarMax was. They didn't understand the concept. So, And then um, moved on to uh, Chevrolet. As it came Kansas, I mean, there's everything's clumped together because we're not big enough to have our own you know, dedicated dealers. So it was Chevrolet, Cadillac, and BMW, kind of a weird mix. And that's what I moved on to next. And and so I, I, my first car, like, I was so lucky. The first person I ever walked up and talked to just said, hey, how's it going? He's like, I want to buy this truck. And he bought it. They GMAC, which was the bank at the time, rolled $10,000 in negative equity. I'll never forget this, on his truck. And he bought the truck at full sticker. Didn't try and negotiate or anything like that. I mean, nothing you could do nowadays with banks after the big, you know, big recession and bought it. I made 1500 bucks and just going up and saying hi to this guy. And I thought, shoot, this is going to happen every day. I went and bought a plasma screen TV. <laughs> and uh, it's like, boy, this is really easy. And uh, didn't happen the next day or the next day. And so I started to realize it was a little harder than that. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the car business. So I was in college and doing that at the same time. And, and uh, really just hurried up to get college done so I could open up my own car dealership. And that was in 2010. And do you still have the dealership? Um, no, I closed it, uh, two years ago to, uh, to, you know, switch to the different business. It's a, a franchise for steak burgers, Freddy's frozen custard and steak burgers. I don't think it's up in your area yet. Uh, they're doing them in Philadelphia, I think. Uh, but getting close up there, it's, it started in Wichita, where I'm from, in 2002, and it's up to 200 something locations now. So, but uh, anyway, getting a little off there. Uh, where were we? I'm sorry. <laughs> we were talking about so. You, so you started up the dealership. And I just did something weird with Mike. You started up the dealership, um, working. So you decided to branch out and work on your own, which is a little yeah. weird for yeah. someone right out of college, right? I, it was. I, you know, I saved up money and, you know, had about 30000 in cash and just started going to the auctions and, and buying stuff. In my first week, I bought a 
Jeep Comanche and its motor shot on the way back from the auction. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I think I bought that thing for like three or 400 bucks, which is a, you know, sounds like a great deal now for a four wheel drive Comanche with no rust. But I think I sold it to the salvage yard for, for about that. And then, uh, another one, a Jeep Cherokee bought it and made money on that one. And then just kept going every week and it grew and grew and grew. And I decided to, uh, move to a big location and do the whole thing, you know, cause everybody thinks in a business you got to grow or die. And so I got a big location and bought a bunch of cars and, and that's when things started going downhill because I just couldn't keep up. Um, I just couldn't get enough good inventory and wasn't getting good cars and what had to constantly be looking for cars to buy and not selling them myself. And, and, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of blew up from there. Um, but I still have my, my license through uh, a friend and I still go to the auctions every once in a while when I have some downtime, which is getting less and less with this new business. And then this, this writing thing that just really came out of nowhere in, you know, in the last six months, it's been, it's been a pretty big roller coaster with that. Well, let's, let's kind of touch on, well, I, I got two other places I want to go to. So, one of the things is, so you got in in 2010, in for about five years. I mean, mm-hmm. that's kind of when, like, we've had this big raise and, like, um, you know, to buy here, or pay here places and kind of, like, all of that. Like, yeah. th- those kind of exploded, uh, maybe even just after you got out of the business, where it's, like, those places kind of blew up. And it, it's kind of, you know, did you see any other trends in that business while you were working in it that really made you like i don't know unhappy uh like you thought were like uncouth anything like or just something you noticed while you were doing it um well yeah the the biggest there's the biggest shifts was you know uh people's credit scores took a dump after the recession obviously and so the new car dealers have had realized this that they can't get financed on the new cars and they're starting to realize there's a butt for every seat so they're keeping every single used car that they can that's sellable and then to couple that, so the, the used car inventory goes way down because of that. And then what's left are these buy here, pay here guys. And they, they make money on the financing. So say a Camry books out at five grand and they pay 4,500 for it. It sounds crazy because, I mean, okay, there's most thing you're ever going to get for is five grand, but they make money on the financing. So they'll get somebody to pay 300 bucks for six years, you know, and, and make 15 grand on it. So they don't care what they pay for it. All they care about is that car lasting till the end of the term of the loan? And if it gets repoed two or three times in there and sold to somebody else, it just needs to last. So the very desirable cars, um, like mostly you know the Toyotas, the Hondas, the Japanese stuff, that they just bring stupid money. Um, and then the imports are getting, you know, like the cars we love are too old. They don't show up at the auction anymore. And then the newer ones, the ten-year-old Volvos, the ten-year-old Mercedes, they're getting so complicated now that I mean there's just snowballing these problems and you know, that's why people are trading them in so you go to the auction and most of the cars are just total junk as far as the uh, the imports uh, so you're you're sifting through it's just you know I I call it the turd hunt um, you know I, it's it's really tough um, so I yeah it, it just got too hard I, I had no problem selling cars it was always just a matter of finding inventory and I was flying all over the country at one point just to find a, a new honey hole, you know, to, to be able to bring cars back. And it, it got really tough. Yeah, it, I, it's funny. But while you were talking about that, I just remember some, the fact that it was a 10 year old car at an auction. Um, someone who listens to the show actually found the old Volvo that blew two head gaskets that I owned at a dealer <laughs> auction and bought it. And I was quite impressed by that. They put a new engine in it. They're like, Ike, is this your car? Like, yeah, that's yeah. my car. So that's crazy. Like 8, 850R, if I remember correctly. Is uh, that what it was? V70R, V70R. 70R? Oh, yeah. okay. Same V70. basic thing. Yeah. You know, it, for, mm-hmm. for a Mercedes person to remember that is, you know, quite remarkable because the you just want to go with all numbers because that's how Mercedes likes to do. Like, eh. <laughs> like yeah. How do yeah. you keep it? How do you keep it straight? I can't keep Mercedes nomenclature straight for the life of me oh they've they've totally lost their marbles i mean there was a time where it actually meant something and now it doesn't um 
you know, of course, they call the, the C63 was actually a 6.2 liter V8. And now it's they kept the name because they didn't want to go backwards, even though it's like a four liter V8 now, but they still call it a C63. And it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. So I don't know. I, like, I don't keep the new ones straight at all. I, I just see like, uh, and, and then they change the names. Like, a, it's still an ML to me. It's not a, a GLC or a GLE or a, a whatever. I mean, I don't follow the new stuff that much. And it, it's like, what? What are they? They need to figure it out and then stick to it because they've changed their mind on this stuff like four times in in thirty years. It's kind of kind of sad. So yeah, it, <laughs> I can't keep it straight for the life of me. I, right. I I can't I can't do old Mercedes. I can't. I just go whenever I have a Mercedes discussion with anyone, it's like, okay, which one is that one again? Is that the four door or the two door? Mm -hmm. And like, is it the big one or the small one? Like, the only thing yeah. I can keep straight is like the C. Like C means coupe, and that's about it. So sometimes, okay. yeah, you know, now they have like a GLC or something like that, which is I think what the GL. Uh, I just dude, it's it's bad. <laughs> so, like my first, my first kind of viral video, I was years ago where I. I'd made like a Hitler downfall one, you know, those that big internet thing back then where you do that, that do a dub over of Hitler's uh, speech in the bunker in that one movie, yeah. and it was all just ranting about the the badges and and the and the CLA and how you know they're making a front wheel drive Mercedes now and all that stuff and I mean it, it, yeah it's 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 frustrating even for Mercedes enthusiasts so <laughs> yeah it's it's nuts. Well, we kind of touched on it briefly a bit ago, so let's kind of go full hog into this. So you, you said you got into the journalism thing relatively recently. How did that happen? Total accident. Like, I've listened to your stories and, and your, your Jalopnik writers and, and everything, and, and, you know, I admire these guys so much, and they work so hard to get where they're at and and all their experience. And, you know, it's it's incredible how much they paid their dues and everything. And mine was just total luck fell in the lap i mean i feel like such an ass saying it but I, that's how it happened i got a message like i i'm one of those you know probably thousand emails a day that patrick gets saying hey i want to write for you I'm, i really like writing and can you give me sh you know and and of course he sends back a polite email but you know we're not looking for anybody right now and uh when doug left jalopnik i knew that that was the chance, <clears throat> but it was also, and I I tried to catch, you know, you just posted Patrick's interview today, today since we're doing this a week later, and, you know, I tried to catch up on that because I I got a little bit of the behind the scenes when it was going down with me and Jalopnik as far as all the Gawker thing, but he couldn't hire anybody. Doug left, and I applied, and I pestered him and pestered him and pestered him, and sometimes he replied, a lot of times he didn't, and he really couldn't hire anybody because. He didn't know if he was going to have any money to to pay for any the people he had, and uh, uh, so the the tipping point was a friend messaging me and saying, "Hey, I just got tickets to the Grand Tour, uh, you know, the new show with Jeremy Clarkson, James May, and Richard Hammond, to their taping, and would you like to go?" And it's in two or three days or something like that. I'm in Kansas. It's in California. Of course, yeah. I'm like. Yes, I drop everything, I fly out there, and I get the bright idea that I'm going to cosplay this. And it's me and two other guys, and we dress up as the Interceptors. I don't know, do you watch the old Top Gear at all? Yeah, I do. The uh, For the people who don't know, it was a spoof of like the old um, like British spy movie genre with Clarkson and Hammond in there. So, right. And, so I had, and Jensen Interceptors. So. I had the big porn stash with yeah. the pink scarf. And, and, you know, and the other guys dressed in the suits and everything else. And we, and we get on the bus and we ride out to the desert and it's like you shit your pants the moment we pull up because we're the first bus there. And there they are. Jeremy Clarkson, James May, Richard Hammond, ready to greet you as you get off the bus. You wouldn't expect this. You wouldn't expect, you know, that they come out and say hello in front of a crowd. No, they're, they sit and they meet every single person. So we get off the bus and and Jeremy sees us and recognizes us and laughs and shakes her hand and it starts the whole day of you know me following around Jeremy Clarkson and him laughing and making you know Jensen interceptor jokes and me making jokes and having conversations about drive tribe and some other things and and I you know he'll probably never remember me but I feel like we hit it off I mean I, I met the other guys and had brief conversations like talked about Richard Hammond's uh, 
winching in the Land Rover, and uh, uh, you know James May. I you know I think I told him I really liked his you know putting his stuff together videos with the lawnmower or something like that. It was really brief with with uh, James May, but Jeremy it kept you know we kept bumping into each other and having these moments and. There was even one part where I yelled something out, out and sort of set him up for a joke that was kind of crude about Richard Hammond and a donkey, and he kind of ran with it. <laughs> so, um, uh, it, it, you know, and then the car in the in the desert, you know, I I wrote ape on the windshield and kind of drew a penis going towards him just to joke around and and you know, so it was really you know that kind of fun atmosphere, and they were you know really cool, and we were having a good time and. So at the end of it, I tweeted him and said, thanks for the party, had a great time. Of course, this is the filming for that opening sequence where they spent $3 million on a one-minute long opening sequence. It was incredible. The cars out there, the people out there, Matt, Matt Farhoff, Smoking Tire was out there, um, like Barry Weiss from, I wasn't expecting seeing him, uh, from uh, Storage Wars. I don't know if you ever watched that crazy show, yeah. but he was out with one of his cars. It's just all kinds of weird people. And... Uh, uh, at the end of it, I tweeted him and didn't expect anything. He immediately tweeted me back and said, it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. And so I sent that screenshot of that tweet to Patrick George. And it's like, ha ha, look at this. And got an immediate reply and said, do you want to write about this? And that's that's how I got in. And it's just crazy. So lucky. <laughs> that is That is a series of very fortunate events there, but... You know, it, you've got to be willing to wear the pink scarf if you want to write about the you know, drive or uh, the grand tour. I guess that's what it comes down to. So, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it. Oh, that's such a great story. Uh, I mean, because Clarkson's everyone's favorite, right? Like it, he has to be, right? Oh yeah, big big inspiration for me. I don't know if you picked up on it with with what I write, but but it's definitely he is definitely the big big inspiration for that. For, you know, for what I do. And I, I just grew up with him. Um, so I, you know, I, I occasionally use British colloquialisms, which is weird because I have kind of a redneck accent. So it's a weird mix, but it's just because I was just watching Top Gear forever. So it's it's a kind of a weird mix. But yeah, big fan, huge fan. It was like, you know, top, you know, top three people that I'd want to meet in my life. So it, it's it's really neat. And Doug was up there too. So this leading to, to, to Doug because I'm a I was basically Doug DeMuro's number one fan so that that's the other part of this extreme luck I mean just luckiest guy in the world for sure so what did you cosplay as to get Doug's attention <laughs> what I did to get Doug's attention is I bought a Range Rover at auction which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Doug's Range Rover um, uh, but I know CarMax very much is so yeah, <laughs> yeah he uh he, you know, he exploits. Uh, he's trying to make Carmax bankrupt with his, uh, with his Range Rover uh, warranty that he bought for five years, uh, I think, or four years, something like that. And you know, it's already quadrupled what he paid for the warranty and all that stuff. You know, it's just in repairs constantly for his Range Rover. So I bought a Range Rover for less. It was a 2004, so same body style, and I bought it for less than what he paid for his Carmax warranty on. His Range Rover, and I, I mean, I, so I bought this thing for like three grand, and went through and tried to fix it and still be under that number that he paid for his warranty, and I got damn close. I, I lost on the radio, so I I ended it by just putting like a home clock radio with my iPhone in it and saying, "There's my navigation system. It's fixed. There you go, Doug Doug Demure. I just beat your ass, you know." <laughs> and, so, and so that was the big shot across his bow. This was with Jalopnik and. I, I, I think that's when he first noticed me, other than, you know, me just tweeting at him or, you know, commenting on his stuff. But that, that was the first thing that he really, I know he commented on it. So that's how I got his attention. And, uh, you know, I wanted his spot at Jalopnik, um, but I also, you know, Doug is just so talented and we have the same kind of car histories sort of work histories and just just think the same way and I you know just such a big fan that, that really really working with him what I was really excited about and so I'm totally thrilled with with what's going on right now he is a fantastic just person like 
with the interactions I've had with Doug have all been absolutely delightful. Um, oh yeah. And then seeing him go to Auto Trader and kind of create a, you know, because he had to from the ground up make a thing. You know, Auto Trader is the place where people go to look at cars for dealerships. It's not really in the past a place you thought of going for and getting your car news. But I think Oversteer is a great addition to it, and I, giving him and you the ability to go through all those classifieds, I think is a wonderful, you know, tool it's, to have at your disposal. So. It, it is a bottomless pit of of stories for sure uh, to to go on there and and see what's what's listed and and you know an endless source of material for Doug, which is you know incredible the amount you know he he's able to post like three stories a day and they're all good and two videos a week i mean just he's total juggernaut it's unbelievable what what he can put out and how good he can keep putting out consistently for sure it's i mean is it you uh let me let me try to reform the thought well what did you go to school for what was your degree in i couldn't get through all the math and in in business, so I went for political science. It's the easiest degree to get it done and get out of there. So, yeah, no, no writing background, no journalism background, none of that. Mm -hmm. So, so for you then going into doing the journalism aspect and the video aspect, was it difficult to kind of like find your voice doing that, or did it slot in kind of naturally? Um, you know, I, I, I really think that I just drew on my past and what I watched, you know, as far as, uh, you know, watching the Jeremy Clarkson reviews and then watching the Doug reviews and uh, sort of kind of cr created a hybrid on that. But really, I, you know, I have to write a really, really detailed script and have pretty much everything that I'm going to say in the videos already written out before I say it because I'm not, I'm not to that point yet where I can come up with with stuff <laughs> organically off the cuff, off the cuff, you know. Um, uh, but uh, it, you know, I've, I feel like I've improved a lot. I've learned a lot. You know, I, I started out using those horrible, like uh, Windows PowerPoint, like uh, <laughs> transitions with my scenes, and people are posting on my YouTube comments like, "What the fuck are you doing? I haven't seen this since 1995." And you know, so it was it was a learning curve for sure. But uh, yeah. I, I personally kind of like them. I, I, I think they're a little goofy, but I always assumed it was on purpose on the goofy factor. So it, Yeah, no, it wasn't. I just had totally clueless. And <laughs> still. It, it, I mean, the videos, to that end, though, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, I, can, I got the great equipment, I got the great camera, I got the best editing software, um, but they forget they got to be fun and engaging on video, and you do a good mm -hmm. job. You do the thing you need to do. You're fun. You're engaging on video, which is all you can really ask for in a review. Um, Thank you. It, it's. I mean, I, I'm just try, like, I'm trying to like think of like the best way to summarize because I I enjoy reading your stuff. I enjoy watching the stuff. For those of you who don't, who aren't subscribed, go subscribe to Hoovy's Garage so you kind of get the updates there. And you know, make sure you follow along with Auto Trader Oversteer. You know, so you can get the updates whenever you post. Um, I, I don't, it's such an interesting place to be. I mean, you know, you're right there alongside Doug, and um, when stuff posts up, you know, do you have a requirement of like how much Doug wants out of you a month or anything like that? Uh, one a week. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be a video every week, but I've been doing it, and uh. Um, may get to the point where I have to do more, but my or I want to do more. Uh, uh, you know, if we keep growing, but uh, you know, also I have my day job just like everybody else, and you know, when I get to the point where I'm, you know, opening a new store or something like that. My, you know, my life gets really busy. So he knows, and he's very flexible about it. I mean, just absolutely, you know, you know, he's the nicest guy to interview. You can imagine working for him. He is the nicest dude ever, and I, you know, it's. I can't believe that I get to, you know, email this guy. And even if it was just him watching my videos and that's it, that would be enough because it's just, you know, it's just incredible because I look up to him so much. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really just totally thrilled. And you know, that's uh, my part. Part of the thing with my video every week is is trying to do something to make him laugh because I know if I can do that, then then I'll probably be doing well. Um, 
so that that's that's probably the main thing that I think about when I'm writing all this stuff up and you know I'll throw a little pot shot at him and you know see if he catches it and and that kind of stuff so it's it's so much fun it's incredible and for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Tyler's writing I would recommend going out um one of my favorite articles you've written is the one about the uh, Mercedes that you grew up with. Yeah, the video is fantastic. You have your grandmother in the vehicle with you. She yeah. tells a she tells a great story about what happened to her the day prior. And I don't <laughs> want to spoil it for everyone, but it's it's, yeah. it's worth watching. Um, well, <laughs> you see, we talked about the car, you know, and I wanted to I wanted to talk to her about the car and getting it and all that stuff, and. That's the one, you know, I didn't put any of the car stuff in there because that, and if you go see it, you'll see why. I mean, that's just what it was because it, it just captured her in that moment and she had no idea the camera was on. And, and yeah, I, <laughs> it's, uh, I, people need to quit emailing me. Sorry, let me close that window. <laughs> it, it's fine. I, I'm not picking up the alert on here. It, it, it's weird when, because uh, of the way the microphones work and all that, but that's technology. So anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, what, what do you have in the current car stable? Like, what is, um, you know, sitting in your garage right now? Uh, my my garage fits four cars, and that's initially, I bought the car, I thought four cars in there, that'll be good, and then I won't go over that. And I have ten cars right now, so that didn't really work. Um, so it starts, you know, and, and people are like, holy crap, you got ten cars. Well, if I sold them all off, I could maybe buy one nice car. I mean, it's a fleet of mostly well, I say mostly hoopties, but now a couple I've got hawked pretty good. But uh, the oldest one is a 78 Lincoln Continental Town Coupe. It's the longest car of the bunch, like 19 feet. Um, it's, it's recurring thing in the videos is, you know, when I park it, I do like what James May, you know, constantly hitting things when I park things because it has the big bumpers. You can just hit things and it doesn't hurt it. It just moves things out of the way. Um, and then I have to... I have the 91 Dodge Caravan, which is an all-wheel drive caravan with 49,000 miles. It has wood paneling. It has off-road tires because it's all-wheel drive. It's the first year all-wheel drive. You probably don't want all these details. I'm sorry. The no, that I, 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 I want the details, especially on the caravan, because the caravan, <laughs> I, I, if you have a, you, you need to see, you need to go watch a video because just the look of that van out there mudding is absolutely fantastic. Mighty van with its rally fogs and, and yeah, mudding tires that are probably worth about the same as the van. That was really stupid. Um, yeah, just yeah, it's 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 a sight for sure. And the wood paneling, it's it's ridiculous. We uh, need to take that on a, uh, a gambler because that that's a perfect vehicle for the gambler. So. I don't know what the gam- what's the gambler. Okay, so the gambler is. Um, a rally, kind of like the cheap car challenge, like almost mm-hmm. like the it, similar to the Lemons Rally, but it's free to I, enter, and it's off road, like two day event. So. Oh, this thing would would fall apart. It would it would yeah. It's it's 1991 Chrysler product. I mean, it, I, I'm scared to take it over a speed bump, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. I'm planning on when the when it thaws, I'm going to drive it up this mountain in Colorado that I could barely. I felt like I barely made it in the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon, and it goes up to 13,000 feet elevation to the top of this ski mountain, and it's, it's where they serve, service a weather station. And I figured if it doesn't make it, then I can just kind of leave it there and walk away from it. <laughs> but uh, that, that's sort of the goal when, the, when, the, when everything thaws. It was, it was supposed to be a winter beater, but we really haven't had a winter at all. There's no, no snow. So... Um, yeah, no snow this year. And I remember six years ago we had negative six, and I bought an old diesel pickup in the blizzard that wouldn't start. So it, it's it's weird. We just have no no winter. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, yeah, then there's the 500 SL which we've talked about. That was my grandmother's car that she gave me when I was 16. And then the 300 SD, the uh, diesel. You know, I still keep to my old Mercedes diesels. And this one I converted to a stick shift, mm-hmm. and that made a lot of fun. And so that's what's inside the garage at home right now. And then sitting outside is uh, Apollo 911, my 99 Porsche 911 with 244,000 miles on it. It's never been rebuilt or anything. It's all original. And then the S600 sits outside, which is weird priorities of cars. My more expensive cars are sitting outside, but they have full coverage insurance, so if they get hailed on, then I get paid. Um, anyway, 
I didn't need to tell you that. Uh, uh, then the NSX is at the shop, all torn up. Uh, it's getting everything redone. And that's the, the 1992 Acura NSX with a uh, manual transmission that was the cheapest NSX in the country. And I bought it sight unseen, and it showed up, and I had, you know, a thousand problems. And it, anyway, it's a basket case, but it's getting there. And then the cheapo, the $500 one, is a 93 Lincoln Town Car Jack Nicholas edition, which is a famous golfer. And he they let him design the car, which was a mistake. And so the seats white like a golf glove, and then the carpets are green like a golf course. And yeah, it's, it's as bad in your head as you're probably picturing it right now. And then his little Jack Nicholas Golden Bear badges all over the car. It's like... Hit my ride, 1993. I mean, it has like little fuzzy covers on the speakers. I mean, it's like you would put it on top of your golf clubs, like your driver. It's it's ridiculous. I bought it for 500 bucks because it was hilarious. I'll do a video on that at some point. But that's that's the fleet. I think. Oh, ML55 AMG. See, I can't even remember all my cars. ML55 AMG. That that one too. Yeah. So maybe I'm missing. I mean. It's about as perfect a garage as you can really get, like a perfect fleet, I think, because you have the goofy stuff, the fun stuff, the nice stuff, relatively, and then you have the car that's always in the shop, which is ironically the only uh, Honda out of the fleet. I, so. Yeah, I think it'll be reliable when it's done, but it's just like this car's 25 years old, and they just never, ever fixed anything that went wrong. I mean, it's like like a typical Honda owner. I mean, it's just, just like, I clean the oil and that's it, you know, and there's everything. Everything's broken except the engine and transmission. And the paint is really nice. I I think they had like a 20-stage painting process on these cars, so the paint jobs hold up really well. So I'm lucky on that. Uh, but and at some point, in like sometime in the mid-2000s, they watched an episode of Pimp My Ride and decided to do what they were doing on – to on the interior of this car and it's 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 a shit show um so i've got that all gutted out and getting redone um so that'll be the big unveil when it's when it's all done um and then i'll probably do like uh like jimmy kimmel when they have the celebrities read mean tweets i'll have the meanest youtube comments and i'll read them aloud and then show haha look at this but but uh that's that's the plan if i ever get it done well, the shop can't keep it indefinitely, except for some of the shops I know probably could keep it indefinitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if you had to guess, like, how many cars you have actually physically owned in your life, do you think you could take a stab at that number? Mm, well, I mean, you're you're talking dealership, so, you know, I'm selling cars to make money. I mean, that's not, that's not several hundred, you know, um, got, got, you know. Cars that I would say that I've owned, or the cars that I'd like. If I put at least a thousand miles on it, then I feel like that I've owned it. That that's something that I've committed to, and that's that's still probably over a hundred. That number, which is insane. Yeah, I mean, you name it, I've probably tried it. You know, so there's there's a few Volvos in there. There's a uh, uh, there's been one Volvo wagon, a uh, V70 T5, and it was it was nice. I really like the Volvos, the seats. And the stereos in those, the seats and the stereos of the factory are unbelievably comfortable. Um, so, I, you got that going for you. I had a 240 with a stick that every once in a while, I mean, the, the overdrive on the stick shift worked when it wanted to, which I think is a Volvo thing. Um, so, yeah, I've had a few Volvos. Well, I, I'm very jealous I want the 240 with the stick, but since it wasn't a wagon, I'm not that jealous. Um, oh. It, it's got, it's wagon or bus for me. It doesn't really, or hatchback. I'll take a hatchback Volvo too. Okay. But, yeah, I, I had an early video effort with a friend of mine who we we did most car that the car that was going to be the most appreciated 30 years from now, and it was a Volvo P1800 is what he picked, and we drove it to Amelia Island, and I had a Buick Riata, and obviously the Volvo P1800 was was the better pick, but it kept breaking down. <laughs> I mean, it, kind of like your story. That's what I was thinking about. Is all those years ago is is him chucking his alternator belt every once in a while, every hundred miles or so because the tensioner was going bad and it kind of reminded me of your story but we actually made it to florida and then we towed the car back but uh, uh yeah that, that was a that was a trip well i made it from maryland to west virginia so that's basically the same thing right before towing it back <laughs> yeah that's yeah 
we go to back to Florida to Kansas. It was, yeah, I was like, we're not, I had a Buick Roadmaster wagon at the time that was sort of our camera car. And uh, we used that with a tow dolly to haul that piece of junk back. I mean, it, it was, it, you know, of course, a nice car, but this thing was one of the worst examples I've ever seen of a Volvo P1800 that still ran and drove. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was bad. We, we, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is another tangent, but we took it to a, a car show, and I had my Riata, which, are you familiar with the Buick Riata at all? I, I am not. It, it, it's a CA50 it, at the moment. Well, basically, it was it was General Motors designers were pissed off because they, they had made a Cadillac convertible for the first time in, like, over a decade, and they went with an Italian design coach company at Pininfarina to design it, and they were so mad that they designed their own coupe convertible that, to look Italian, and it was a Buick Riata but it was American made designed a hundred percent. Well, the judges got confused and thought that my Buick was Italian designed and led it on the fairway at Amelia Island at this Italian car show. And the Volvo P1800, I think was designed by Ghia. Yes. It right. Was. Yeah. And they saw, they took, they let my car on, even though it wasn't Italian. And they took one look at Miguel's Ghia designed piece of junk and said, uh, parking's over there, sir. You can go over this, this way. And he was so dejected. <laughs> it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a little sorry, little Volvo tangent there. Sorry, oh, that's for, that's what we do on the show, sir. It, it, it's <laughs> what, what's the weirdest thing about all this to me though is that the world record holder for the car with the longest life and original owner is a Volvo, and it's yep. a P eighteen hundred, and that's just nutty to me. So yeah, it, what yeah. was it? The hatchback or was it the uh, uh, fastback? It, it was yeah, it was the Roger Moore and the Saint looking coupe. Yes, so yeah, I guess you wouldn't like it because it's not a wagon. It's like no. It doesn't work. It's not a Volvo in my mind. It just doesn't. It's got to be practical. If you can't have kids facing out the back of it, it doesn't count as a Volvo. That what doesn't... do you think about? Do you think that those two forty wagons and those eight all that are they worth what they're worth now? I mean, like a ratty Volvo two hundred and forty wagon. People want five grand for them now, and it just seems like. It seems crazy to me, but I mean, if you already own one, you're happy about it. But if you don't, you like them, then it then it pisses you off, like me. But uh, I don't know. What do you think about it? You think it's it's worth that? No, not so. Where I live, um, there's this like hipster car scene in D.C. Like we get all the um, congressional and like you know executive branch staffers. They come in every year or two. So you get this influx of people who are around 20 who don't want who want to pretend they don't give a crap about cars, but want right. to, want a unique car, and they all seem to gravitate towards Volvo 240s, which has just driven their prices up like crazy. I think yeah. the last time I saw one on Craigslist, like it was a ratty example, and the guy wanted eight grand for it. I'm like, you're nuts, eight grand for yeah. that car. Yeah, I I, I just noticed that recently because I was on you know I do still do the nightly Craigslist, Craigslist search because I'm. I'm an idiot, and you know, something, and I have ten cars. Like, why are you looking on Craigslist every night? But yeah, there's a Volvo wagon for five grand. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And then I go and look it up. It's like, oh my god, that's actually like the deeper end of them. I was like, what? What happened in the last two years? I I just was shocked. The only thing I can think of is, um, the lady who did the Twilight movies. Like oh. they, they used a whole bunch of Volvos in that, and then she did a couple of movies following that, and it's just a whole bunch of Volvos in that for whatever reason. So I haven't seen. I know. I know what you're talking about the movies because they advertised it. But yeah, kind of like Breaking Bad and the Pontiac Aztecs, and now people like them. And and uh, I guess the DeLorean, Back to the Future, to another big example. But yeah. yeah. It's like as soon as like you see it in the movie, people are like, "Oh, that that's that car worth having." So it didn't have that same effect on my C30 for some reason, but you know yeah. that's fine. Um, no, it, it's crazy. What I think, like I like I love my little 740. I don't think you can find a 740 for more than 1,500 bucks, and like it could be the world's most mint condition 740, and it's still like two grand. And I think mm-hmm. that's worth having. Not a, I love the 240s. I think they're a great-looking car. But they're not worth fucking five grand. They're not worth three grand in my mind. You know, maybe I, a really nice one, but not, no. Nah, nah, that's ridiculous. Well, because there, the there was one that I had that, and I, I, I think they changed it too. Not the S, they call it the V90, but it was still that old full-size wagon body style for the last two years. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, so 
the 740 became the 940, which became the V90, and then it died. V90. So I had one of those, like so one of those unicorns, that last year uh, V90 wagon. And the guy actually won it at a golf tournament by hitting a hole in one at, that year. And then he, you know, then he got rid of it. I think I bought it for, you know, a thousand bucks or something like that. You know, <laughs> so but it was a cool story. And I, and I turned, you know, I sold it and I sort of realized, wait, that was sort of a unicorn wagon. I mean, that's sort of the last of the last of the era. And, uh, you know, kind of regretted that I, you know, didn't spend more time with it, you know. Get to experience its, its majesty of its full weird Volvo Ness Fordness kind of mash, mishmash married kind of like we want to kill off this design but we can't pre- we can't make it practical to kill off this design so we're just right. gonna let it linger for forever so, right yeah oh, that, <laughs> we we got off on a weird Volvo tangent so <laughs> where I was okay. to start this line of question was I was gonna bring it to what's the worst thing do you think you've ever done to a vehicle. It's with it's with that 500 SL for sure because I got it when I was 16. So you can imagine um, I put modern AMG wheels on it that were the wrong offset that looked like looked like cart roller skates on it, and were you know way too far in. So I put those on there, and then I wanted it to be louder. So I took it to a muffler shop and said, Hey, put me on one of those loud Flowmastery thingies, and so they put a loud exhaust muffler on it on a 500 SL. And then I decided, you know, the thing has two speakers in it, and they're in the they're little two inch speakers in the dashboard, and you really could not hear the stereo with with the top down driving around. So I had them put boxes in the back with six by nines, and I picked out these electric blue ones to match the blue interior, and put in one of those stereos that had the uh, that did the little laser light show thing with the music and all that stuff. So I definitely, you know high school kitted that thing out for a little while <laughs> so uh, been undoing that over the years uh just i've been slowly making it into like a period correct amg conversion like of the 80s because amg used to be just a, a tuning company it wasn't part of mercedes up until you know the 90s and so it's it's a fun little scavenger hunt uh to source these old amg parts and uh put them on and do you know all the period correct stuff so that's that's what i've been doing to undo it but yeah, there's a there's like my my high school senior photo, which has still I still have a bowl cut at in 2005, which is I'm probably the last person in the world that still had one, and I'm posing with my Mercedes, you know, trying to look all seductive with these giant roller skate wheels on it. It's just the most ridiculous senior photo, but it, it's so me, and uh, uh, I'm I'm glad I have it. But yeah, it's the whole the whole thing's ridiculous. It's. I, I can't. I've never owned the car long enough to regret the stupid stuff I've done with it. But I look back at stuff I did to cars and went like, you know, um, that was dumb. And if I still owned that car, I'd be hating me right now. Like, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Mercedes, the SL has been around. You know, it's had cars come and go. It's seen everything you've owned. And I guess with that being the staple in your life, it's kind of seen all the different phases of like car enthusiasm. So like you said, like the, the speakers, the radio, and then you have to undo the stuff that you did to it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just too perfect. Now all the phases of my life, you know, I thought about at one point in high school because the burl wood was kind of chipping away. I thought, you know, that probably looked really good if I spray painted it yellow and thank goodness do it. Like I went into Microsoft paint with a picture of the interior and you know, you know, when you're when you're practicing and you go and you just go over with the brush to see what the console would look like yellow, all where the wood is. I was like, oh, that doesn't look too bad. Maybe I'll do that one summer. And I didn't do it mercifully, but you know, there's there could have been a lot more bad decisions <laughs> made. I didn't I didn't wreck it. You know, I didn't blow anything up too badly. So I I, I was very lucky there as well. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you think is the worst? Repair quote. I'm, I'm putting in here quotes. Repair you've ever done to anything? Like ghetto fied. Yeah, uh, like used car dealer for years. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> moving. On. I I guess for legal reasons we can't get into that one too much. Stations uh, <laughs> have wound up on that. No, I wasn't. I wasn't too shady, but but uh, you know, I mean, 
there's there's stupid little check engine lights, and sometimes they're just so easy to yank the bulbs when it's a no, no nonsense code. I mean, it, 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 anyway. And moving on. Sorry, sorry. It's it's bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me uh, see here. What we'll go through a little thing because I somehow managed to get away from that. Da, 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 da. Um, oh, here, here's an interesting question. So, um, if we gave you an unlimited budget to do a story for uh, Oversteer. Um, you know, you could do the video, you could do the article, whatever. Uh, what do you think you would do with it? Oh, that'd be yeah. Um, I would love to get the 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 fifty five Mercedes racer and reenact that race in Europe. The the Milli Miglia. Have you heard of it? You know, where Sterling Moss set that world record driving. You know, from around uh, Europe. Um, you know, reenacting those those European races on the roads and see how what they're like before and after, hmm. or, um, gosh, Duesenberg's. I would love to do like a like some sort of crazy Duesenberg video. I'm such a nut about those cars and uh, see if I can get a Duesenberg to do donuts. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, I think it would do it. They're so twerky. Nobody's ever done a Duesenberg burnout video. Not even Jay Leno. He has a fleet of them. Like, Jay, if you're listening, a Duesenberg burnout video would make my life. Um, so that'd be cool. Um, yeah, build a time machine, go back and save the Tucker Corporation. That's another car company I'm nuts about. So driving a Tucker Torpedo, that's a dream car. They only made about 50 of those. Have you heard of those, the Tucker? Yeah, the really interesting cars. Um I think Steve Leto wrote a book about... Yeah, he did. I think I actually own that book. Um, I don't know. I just get him to sign stuff for me sometimes. Um, interesting book. Interesting... No, I don't have that book. That's the one I don't have from him, I think. I don't know. Now I have to go back through and check. Um, but no, I really like the um, Tucker. It, it kind of like is a weird like study in why the big three were so super evil back in the day. Oh yeah, I mean it's the it's the Tesla of its day, and, and uh, yeah, he, he got totally just strong armed out of it. It's such a such a tragedy. All the advances that would have happened, you know, um, with that car, and you know, they they predicted that it might have done 30 miles to the gallon with that helicopter engine in the back, which a car, I mean, imagine that thing weighs you know 6,000 pounds like everything else back then. So it would have been a marvel. Um, uh, but yeah, that's it's a shame. I. Yeah, I really would love to get. That's one of my little bucket list things. Like when I go to a car event and uh, I see a Tucker, then I get my picture with it. And I think I'm up to like ten Tuckers, and there's only forty or so still in existence. So I'm I'm doing pretty good. Do you think the name Tucker had anything to do with its demise? Um, no. I mean, I don't think so. No. Why? I don't know, like, Tucker to me just seems, it reminds me of uh, Ace Ventura. So I'm just like, you know, mm, bad connotation with that, you know. It's a Tucker. Um, you don't get that, but someone listening is going to get that. Um, oh, it's Ace Ventura. I, of course, I know uh, nonsense booby pants and talking out my butt. And, All righty then, but what's the, what's the? Uh, Einhorn is Finkel. Finkel is oh, Einhorn. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. We got it. Okay. It took us a while to get there. Um, I'm in. <laughs> exactly. Get your own merino. All that sort. Of... Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's. Uh, we're, we're getting close to time here, so we're going to go down our uh, inside the actor studio type of questions. Um, okay. So, uh, as, some, as someone who's listened to the show, you have a little bit of an advantage in this. So. Um, because you know what they are. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what's your favorite car? A 300 SL Mercedes. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your least favorite car? I, you know, I should I should know that. I, I really, um, I'm gonna say, yes, uh, Toyota Prius. Mm. That's a that's a good answer. Um, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Something that's funny. Uh, uh, what modification trend? Uh, see, I need to redo that question because I, I have that question written there, and that's not the way the question's supposed to come out. So let me rephrase this. What modification trend uh, turns you on? Like, uh, 
stance, frodos, or stuff like that. I like I like uh, preservation, patina, um, that kind of thing, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, what modification trend do you hate? No. I yeah, stance. Um, yeah, the lowering for no reason, for sure. I expected. So the stance thing is that big in Wichita? It it is. Um, you know, Wichita's flat with not a lot of speed bumps, so you can kind of get away with it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it it is. I mean, it, it, it's kind of a, a pointless. Yeah, I, I don't. I, it doesn't look good to me. Um, mm-hmm. I find that a little shocking. I would have thought that Wichita would have had much worse um, trends. Uh, what car do you stuck? What car do you dread to be stuck behind at a red light? A gravel truck. That's a good one, yeah. Oh. Mm. See, what, hmm, random aside, what was the car in Back to the Future that Biff Tan- Tannen put into the back of the uh, manure truck? 48 Ford. Okay. But for some reason, wasn't there another one? Or was, were they both 48 Fords? I feel, like um, ended, I feel like he ended up there twice. Oh yeah, and that and the like the future one. Yeah. Um, was was it that was he in a was he in a BMW six series convertible or no? I don't know what the future the Back to the Future two was, but uh, I think the first one was the forty eight Ford. I remember Doc saying like that's a forty eight Ford. You can't hit, hit hit that thing. But I don't remember two. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look up two because it I, I I remember it being German. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, but it's, I want to say like it's a six series. Like they they did a weird six series thing. Yeah, uh, just six thirty five. Let's throw some fins on it. It'll make sense. Uh, <laughs> that's what twenty sixteen looks like, right? Is fins and weird right, helmets right. and hoverboards. Um, yeah. What automotive sound or noise do you love? Oh gosh, uh, definitely a V twelve. Uh, uh, just about any V twelve, a Ferrari two hundred and fifty GTO incredible um yeah that's probably the one what automotive sound or noise do you hate art cans <laughs> you, you, you just do not like lowered civics do you like that is I, oh and i'm gonna go to like these japanese car groups at the nsx and they're like dude bro and i'm like uh, yeah hey guys i but i i don't know yeah mm-hmm. You are you are a masochist because you are getting the car that is going to attract those guys more than any car on the planet. Like, I, I yeah, I never thought about it. I, yeah, it was just kind of an impulse. Oh, that's cheap. I'll buy it, and then you know, mm-hmm. there, here it is. You you are attracting the people you hate to you. They're gonna flock to you. I don't know. <laughs> like having conversations with them. No, no. It's and I you know, there's a lot of work that went into that. But yeah, I went to one car show, German car show, where it was mostly VW guys, and they're into that lowering and stance thing, and I brought one of my immaculate Mercedes, and I was definitely the wrong, I was in the wrong scene, and I still had a good time, like, they had, like, the best campsite, you know, with all those VW campers and things, and it was really interesting, um, so, no, I, I, I get it, I just, you know, the, the putting a, having a, a Civic and making it sound louder, not actually making it faster in any way, just, is silly, but, anyway, now, a quick aside on that. Do you own any flat-brimmed hats? No. You, you might have to get one just to blend into that crowd. Um, uh, oh, good suggestion. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just flat-brimmed trucker hat. Uh, also, maybe a vape pen just to help you blend in. Uh, you vape? You break one? Yeah. Oh. That, uh, there, there's, have you ever talked to a vaping enthusiast, random again, quick aside? Uh, no, I haven't had the pleasure. No. Um, it is one of the most mind-boggling. Like I understand what non-car people feel like when I talk <laughs> to them, because like, like oh yeah, what you do is you you take it and you get it so it drips right on the element, which gives you more vapor. Which you know, I'm like uh huh, uh huh. And I'm back in my head, I'm like, this guy's nuts. Like, why is he pouring all this money into this stupid pen? And then I had to flash to someone thinking the same thing about me with a Volvo. So it's like, oh. maybe we're not so different. Um. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't, yeah, I didn't even understand what you just said. So now I totally get it. That's what car people, non-car people like. That's because I was, you just blew my mind right now. I had no idea. It was that complicated. 
Yeah, it's like they put extra batteries in there. They like make it drip right onto a heating element, and they do all sorts of like weird modifications to it. I'm like, cool. I don't. I'm gonna go stand somewhere else where I don't have to talk to you. Um, <laughs> let me get back to these questions here. Uh, what profession other than your own in the automotive industry would you like to attempt? Or I guess one that you haven't attempted because you've done a couple things there. Um, yeah, I think if I go back and do it all over again, I'd probably do like a, a restoration shop, I think. I would love to, to have done that. You know, work for the Mercedes Classic Center or something like that. If I had a chance to do a do-over. Mm. That's, that's an interesting one. I, I, do, I, I can see that. Nice old cars. I don't... Do you think the clientele for restoration shops for the sort of people who are into that because the thing I hate more than anything in the automotive community is when like you have the snobby people who or like the midlife crisis people who just want the car that makes them look fast or sporty do you think the Mm -hmm. restoration shop attracts those people as like I'm doing this as a status symbol or do you think it attracts people who are more about trying to capture nostalgia about the vehicle well, you ha- I mean, you have a little bit of both, but I mean, it's just the type of shop you created was what what you would cater to. But so many of these, these people just want to capture, recapture their youth and what they had and what they always wanted, and and, you know, and, and it's a passion project for them, and and they know that they're investing more than what the end product is going to be worth just because they they want something they've always wanted, and it's and and I, I've noticed a lot of people with money like that uh, are and are into cars are very approachable and you know not the, not usually the snobbish type with with the cars i mean there's the there's the dudes that are you know that that bought the corvette z06 you know that are you know midlife crisis mobiles that that can be kind of you know bad but i'm talking about real you know big enthusiasts that that'll pay you know a million bucks for a mercedes or a duesenberg or something like that they're usually really cool guys and and know their stuff and you know, fascinating to talk to about anything, and you know, it would be you know, it would be a pleasure to you know, make their, you know, their vision and their head come alive. So it, it's, I guess, it's kind of a, it'd just be a lot of fun, I think. What automotive profession would you not want to do? Buy here, pay here, dealer for sure, because. <laughs> You're just becoming a bank and a and a debt collector. I mean, it's not about the cars at all. It's it's not it's not a car business. It's a it's a finance business. Mm. What is your automotive pet peeve? Um, engine covers. I don't like plastic engine covers covering up the engine. So, yeah, that. Mm. If it has a supercharger, I want to see the supercharger. If it has a turbo, I want to see it. I don't want to say turbocharged in plastic on top of it. How are you supposed to know it's a Fiesta ST if it doesn't have a giant engine cover that says ST? Come on now. <laughs> well, I have an engine cover, but like I just I just reviewed this one up today, a supercharged Range Rover, and I had a Jaguar XJR that had a beautiful supercharger that you could pop the hood and see this beautiful thing that's in between the intake. But this one, you pop the hood of this $110,000 Range Rover, and it's just a big plastic cover that says supercharged. It's just like this is this is this is so stupid. I I freaked out. Good. Um, what do you think the hardest food to eat while driving is? Pretty much anything from Taco Bell, I would say. Mm. Now, you've heard the show before, and you know how this segment goes, I'm sure, where it turns into stupid stuff Ike's done while driving. But you probably uh. are one of the few people on the planet who probably put more miles on a car than I have. So, you know... Do you you drive the long haul stuff with a manual or with an automatic most of the time? I've done both. Um, yeah, yeah, I switched up. Mm-hmm. Now I would say I there is a methodology to eating stuff from Taco Bell, like when driving a manual, where you can reduce the mess. I'm not, I'm not you, you know there. I don't know. There's a particular like the hard shell tacos probably are the hardest thing to eat there. Have, what right. have you tried dri- driving and eating from Taco Bell? Oh, pretty much. I mean, anything. You know, I've got okay. A bean burrito's nice and wrapped up, and then you hit it on that pressure point, and it squirts right where it looks like charted. You know, it's just it's. You know, 
I, pretty much anything. Even the chicken quesadillas, they have that little bit of a, a spicy sauce to them that always drips out at the inopportune time where it's either you have a massive accident or you get you get spicy sauce on your pants. I mean, it just it's just unavoidable, I feel like. But I'm not very good at it. Well, how often do you eat in the car? Are, are you one of these people who's very finicky about eating in the vehicles? Oh, no, I have to. I mean, I'm traveling like all these stores that were opening or all over the country so i i just want to get there um so yeah i eat in the car all the time so what is your go-to item then eating in the car we're going to change this up a little bit because i'm I'm curious with with the other professional long haulers like what is your go-to food in the car um usually um gosh um you know, we, I, we asked the tough questions here. This is what we do. You did ask. It's a really, yeah, really tough question. I mean, I usually just like uh, protein bars, Cliff bars, uh, that kind of stuff with with a drink or, you know, that whatever's pretty much solid. I think I get a lot of Cliff bars for sure. Yeah. Now, are you a pee on the go man, or are you a go to get to the uh, uh, no. rest stop? No, I I stop. Yeah, that. Yeah, I can't do that. I I can't. I I have trouble peeing in public. Like, I used to go to the nurse and say I shit my pants so I could go home and shit by myself because I couldn't do it in a public restroom like in high school. I was that guy. Shit break like in uh, American Pie. I was that guy. It, it, <laughs> I'm very jealous of the people who can pee in the car because I, I I share a similar malady when it comes to this. Like, I only like to shit at my house. I can shit right. other places, but. It doesn't. F- it never feels quite as good. You know? Ooh, ooh, huh. oh. uh, No, it's always. We got to a weird place. But we did. Then, yeah. We we started const- talking about Taco Bell, and it ends with shitting. That's what happens. Yeah, I'm in San Diego, and I'm constipated right now. So just in case anyone wanted to know, because I'm not home. Yeah. <laughs> so, quick aside, I went. Me and the wife went camping, like one of the very first times ever went camping, and it was probably like a five or six day long camping thing I, I, I tend to be fairly regular not to get too graphic and at the i remember we were driving home and she's like wait did, have you taken a dump this whole time i'm like no i'm waiting until we get home she's like you must have put on like 20 pounds of just pure shit from now yeah. to then it's like yeah probably so. right <laughs> <laughs> but she did but she didn't think that was going to happen there uh, tyler that we we're going to have yeah Hmm? Oh, I just did the Activia oh. thing. Jamie no, Lee Curtis, got to be regular. Yeah. Sorry, so I just did a little. If you gotta gotta help that probiotic in the gut, man, help you help you go poo poo. Um, yeah, the the protein bars help you not go where you don't want to go too, which is nice. Um, this is a car show. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, what's the furthest you've driven without like stopping for more than gas, like? Uh, like, because I've done Wichita to San Diego, it was, you know, 21 hours, and I stopped four times for like less than 20 minutes and did it all straight. That was my. But I figured you're kind of a long hauler, so I don't know if you did anything crazy like that. Um, from the, because I actually started in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, drove to the East Coast in Delaware, and then I drove from there to Chicago picked up my cousin and went from Chicago to Vegas and then for that was the first time we stopped for more than like gas so wow. yeah. yeah that's better that's bigger than mine I figured mm-hmm. but but that was flipping off so I was able to p- go into the passenger seat and pass out for a little bit so I'm not sure if yeah. that counts 100 so. percent I was by myself yeah that was crazy yeah it, it's because it, people don't realize how big like these here, this is my gonna be my complaint to you. So I think Doug falls into this a little bit. So we'll, we'll we'll go ahead. They don't understand how big the rest of the country is. Like you, I have a friend who drives home to Boston occasionally, and he'll mm-hmm. be like, "Well, I drive through like eight states. You drive through like four states. How long could it be?" I'm like, "Well, my trip is 700 plus miles when I go back to Chicago. Your trip's like 300 miles when you go through eight states." He's like, "Oh yeah, our states are kind of small over here. Yeah, the states right. over here are fucking tiny." Like, yeah. Wichita to Cali is what, you know, you're going through Kansas, what, Nevada, maybe Utah. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, 11 miles, something like that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but you're only going through maybe like five states at the most. Yeah, but big ones with a whole lot of nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the versus the northeast where it's like you sneeze and you're in the next state. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there, there are states where you drive through out here and it's like, oh, I didn't realize I was in. Like you'll see like now leaving Delaware. Like, oh, I was in Delaware? I didn't even know. But again, how would you know you were ever in Delaware? Um, yeah. All right. Uh, what's the long? Have you ever driven coast to coast? No, it's always been, you know, because I'm right in the middle of the country, so it's either been I go east or I go west, so I've never done a whole whole coast-to-coast -coast thing. Have you ever driven oh. to Alaska? No, I want to. Oh, that'd be awesome. So how Have many, you? No, I have not. I also want to do it. How many states do you think you've been to then? Uh, shoot, most most of them. I mean, there's Rhode Island, you know, I've gotten up to there so that I haven't done Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont, um, and then I haven't done Dakotas, yeah. Minnesota, that, that kind of that kind of part of the country, so. And then where has the best food you've been? Ooh, boy. Um, gosh. That's... How could you ask that? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> Again, I asked the hard questions, man. Texas. So probably Texas can be out there for, for that. Um, Austin, Texas. Really like the food in that town. Um, had really good food in Philadelphia. I know that. That was an incredible food experience. Philly is okay. Texas is the right answer. I will, yeah. I will accept either Austin or Chicago. Philly has no... They put fucking cheese whiz on their Italian <laughs> beef sandwiches, and that is just unacceptable. That just takes you <laughs> off the culinary planet, as far as I'm concerned. It was, it was just once. I mean, I, yeah, I just remember having really good meals. One, like, in a seafood restaurant that looked over a battleship. I think New Jersey was on the other side. And ran up the rocky steps and then ate somewhere else. So, I mean, you know, I, I really want to spend more time in the Northeast, but I haven't been up there all that much. I've never met Doug in person, which is something I I would love to do. So, but he's yeah, I might be I might be on his uh, I might be on his uh, uh, stalker list. Uh, you know, <laughs> so he he got arm's length on purpose. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have him on the restraining order list here. He can yeah, wait for us, but you have to stay 500 feet away from Doug. That's the word I was looking for. I don't know because he knows I am such a giant super fan of his. And so I think it gets a little awkward for him sometimes because I'll send him an email and he writes something that I really like. And I'm like, oh, Doug, this, you just, you're just amazing, you know. And he's kind of like, oh, my God, this guy again. I guess, you know, I, I can't help it. Like when he went, he recently got, he's going to be in an episode of Jay Leno's Garage. I don't know if you saw this on, on Twitter. Uh, but he actually filmed for the CNBC episode, which is crazy. And got a tour of the garage and all that stuff. And, of course, I'm just freaking out. I just wigging out but and you know send him a send him an email and tweeting i'm like oh and he's probably what the hell this guy just leave me alone so yeah biggest friend crush ever right here probably in the world is is me with that guy oh <laughs> uh, that, that was a great guy though it's, it's easy to be a little man crushy on him um oh yeah my weird one is I just find my I can't I don't think I can ever talk to Patrick Sandell again because I just get lost in his eyes. I just like, <laughs> so dreamy. Um, yeah, uh, this took a weird. This went to a weird place, but I think it went to a funny weird place. So uh, <laughs> I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, yeah, call it for an evening before it gets way too weird. Um, okay. So if everyone's listening, um, Tyler, what's the Twitter handle that they should follow you at? At Hoovy's Garage. Mm -hmm. And then it's the same for uh, YouTube, right? Correct. Yes, right. Hoovy's Garage on YouTube. Right. Yep. And I guess we should spell that out. So it's H-O-O-V-I-E-S Garage. Right? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then autotrader.com slash oversteer. You have an articles up every week for the most part. Every um, week, yeah. And then after that, I think that's pretty much all of them. So I'm going to say goodbye to Tyler off air for everyone listening. For everyone, so Tyler, hold on. For everyone listening, I'll be back with you in a second. Uh, Tyler, any last words? Uh, no, thank you. This was so much fun. I'm thrilled to be on the show and, and talking to you. And I think, did I do okay? I think it went okay. 
Well, I think it went very well. The listeners will let me know for sure. But I think this is a good episode. So. This idiot. All right. <laughs> All right, everyone will be right back.